Hi! Today we'll be talking about the meta, probability, politics, and how to change a game with one simple trick. So I've been playtesting my game uh, over the past six months or so, and it's been an interesting wild ride. Uh, it's gone under a lot of different revisions, and um, I've learned a lot from it. But one of the th major things I've learned is the meta, um, the sort of rules about the rules, uh, is super important, and it drastically affects how the players interact with the game itself. So, um, what is meta? Uh, in common parlance, it is sort of the meta game, right? It is the game about the game. And it's commonly used in things like um, online role-playing games, uh, such as World of Warcraft, uh, or first-person shooters like Overwatch, um, or MOBAs like League of Legends, Dota, things like that. Uh, it usually refers to the specific balance of power between characters or character classes or things like that. It's the discussion about the rules that influences how players choose to play the game. Um, for example, uh, in Overwatch, uh, Mercy used to have a skill where she could just resurrect the whole team and then get killed. Um, but it was leading to a lot of just running in there, hoping that everyone dies at the same time, resurrecting everyone, and then getting shot by the enemy team while your team comes back and smashes everybody. Um, so it, it ended up leading to a certain sort of play style that was very focused on making sure that all your people died on a pile, and also avoiding uh, any sort of conflict until you could come in and make that final play, and then afterwards it didn't matter if you survived or not. Um, which could be fun, but it could be not fun. And so um, just the, the shape of her mechanics led to that certain sort of play style. Um, that's the sort of general game mechanics, but then the meta would refer to the way that she was balanced versus the other characters. Um, and for games that evolve, um, games that are like uh, online games, uh, that tweaking happens pretty frequently. So in order to maybe make that play style a little bit more fun for Mercy players, they're like, well, what if you can only resurrect one person at a time? And so they tweak some things, and then they get feedback, and they're like, ooh, players hated that, but they also kind of had more fun, so let's try tweaking some other things. And those tweaks would then influence how popular Mercy was. Like, if people didn't like the changes, or they made her the suboptimal choice, um, they might go for another healer. Uh, so the meta is basically that that level of um, balancing and optimization that happens due to various changes within the game rules um, that then kind of settle to a certain point until the rules are changed again. Which is why um, for games like Dota or League of Legends you don't usually have one team and one strategy dominating uh, year after year after year because of the meta changes. No matter how perfect your strategy is, how well you've practiced. Um, you know, a 0.5 second delay in a casting time, a, you know, two foot radius increase on a spell, um, all of that could affect the efficacy and um, the sort of practicality of using certain characters over other characters. There are some characters who go from being trash, get a little tweak, to being must picks every single time. Um, and every patch does that. Uh, and it's kind of an accepted part of the game even though people grumble about it. They're like, you know, nerf Riku please, or nerf Tidehunter, buff Lena, whatever. Um, those things are all part of the metagame. 
that discussion about the rules of the game, which then feed into the playstyle of the characters. So how does that relate to the story game that I was making? Um, it's interesting because uh, it, you normally don't get these sort of like meta discussions about games that are sort of codified in a single book. Um, but you will get them about games that evolve over time, like D&D. Um, as each edition comes along, uh, the meta totally changes, um, because how you play the game totally changes based off of certain skills. Um, it's pretty radical between, like, D&D, AD&D, 3rd edition, 4th edition, 5th edition, like, they are pretty, you know, they're almost entirely different games in some respects. But if you look at something like um, Monster Hearts or Apocalypse World uh, version 2, um, you get small tweaks in certain moves that then totally change where a certain character fits into the context of the world. The meta for that character changes. So certain characters that main like certain playbooks that may have never been picked because they were broken or they led to weird consequences um, get tweaked or removed entirely. Uh, for example, in the in the story game tabletop world, um, if you look at Monster Hearts 2, uh, one of the playbooks that was in the first one, The Chosen, was removed. Um, Buffy is gone <laughs> from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, tabletop game. I mean, it's, it was one of the major inspirations, but that archetype, um, the rule set that governed that changed and warped the story so much to focus on that one character that unless your group was down for it, everything kind of revolved around the Chosen. But um, when Avery Alder came back, uh, to it and was like, hmm, let's look at this. I don't know if I want that much spotlighting on one playbook because then it just becomes all about them instead of the interaction between all of the, the different types of monsters. So let's maybe pull that one out and let's change that meta. Let's change the way that players behave with one another based off of these rules. Um, which is fascinating, right? Like just the addition or removal of a single character can disrupt the total balance of the game. Um, and so thing, decisions like what to include, what to exclude, are super important. Um, for my own game uh, that I've been working on for about six months, one of the things that totally changed the meta um, was the shift from playing cards to dice. When I originally envisioned the game, um, I wanted it to uh, be, it's a game about, well, it's a game about a lot of things. It started off as a game about journeys and, and voyages, and then it became a game about bifurcating reality and choose your own adventure stories. Um, but at its heart, it was all about going from scene to scene uh, and then experiencing them based off of a certain set of parameters that I laid out. And originally I envisioned using cards for it because uh, cards, when you put them down, they lay out a very specific sequential journey, um, which suited the original sort of road trip theme. But the first couple playtests were, um, generously speaking, a bit of a mess. Uh, because there were rules that I kind of wrote with the best intentions that never worked out. Um, and with their inclusion, they totally changed the way the game was played. Um, for example, uh, I, uh, the game is played by drawing a card and then using that card, um, the, the suit and the value to describe a scene, either a scene that is narrated or a scene that is acted out um, by the players at the table, uh, but different values have different things uh, associated with them. So 
you know, theoretically, if you played for long enough, you would go through all of the potential permutations in a deck of cards. Um, the one thing that I threw in there for fun that ended up just monkeying up the entire works was the Joker. Um, I thought, oh, it would be fun to have one card there that lets you narratively break the game and um, mechanically break the game. Just, just to, like, your god, god mode for, you know, one round, do whatever you want. Um, which sounds like fun, but it got messy really fast. Because I forgot two things. First of all, um, it's not a universal tenet, but uh, I have found that a lot of times when players are new and unsure of what to do, they default to going gonzo. Um, and while that can be fun, uh, for an initial playtest, you don't want your players going gonzo if it's a, supposed to be a meditative game. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the second thing I forgot was, if you are dealing a hand of cards to each player, each round, you go and you have four players, and each one gets five cards. That's 20 cards cards being cycled each round. Out of 52 cards, um, if you put eight of them on the table as the scenes, uh, you start cycling through really fast, like insanely fast. So having one joker in there mm, is fine if you're only going through 52 cards one at a time. But if you are cycling through almost every single round, you will get a Joker. You'll, you'll get one basically every other round. Um, and it's such a powerful card that incentivizes people to always play it. And so um, that choice, that one rule choice, broke the game. Uh, and it was still fun, but we had to Calvin Ball it really badly. So. What did I do for the next time? I removed the Joker because I was like, oh, that's a bad thing. Um, but by removing the Joker, I still left the other conditions in place. And as I was playing along on the second playthrough, it, things still felt off. They didn't feel as wild, but they felt kind of languid. And part of it was because of something else that I forgot. Um, something that I kind of touched on with the Joker thing, but I never really thought too much about it. If you have a deck of cards, and you are playing with a deck of cards, each time you remove a card, you change the probability that you will draw a specific card the next time. If you have a set of dice, um, every time you roll the dice, it will have the same fixed probability. So, um, a deck of cards will always move you towards certain probability states, whereas dice has a fixed probability curve that you can pretty much always depend on that certain distribution. So the third time I ran the game, I forgot my cards, and I had to make a quick change, and I chose dice and the game played so much more smoothly. Like, I could predict the amount of certain types of scenes that would come out, and then I could tweak the probability curve accordingly in order to produce that certain number of scenes within a certain game length, um, which is something I couldn't do with cards, because as you play the cards, that curve changes. And theoretically, if you didn't ever shuffle the cards, it would be fine, but there was a lot to it. Um, so I had to I had to watch as the meta for my game changed and I the player's behavior changed. Uh, certain things that they would do um, with one sort of probability distribution, uh, like going super gonzo, they didn't bother doing at all with another probability distribution because they were getting more of what they wanted. And the third time, they 
they totally got more of what they wanted and so it was a very satisfying game overall for them. Um, there's still problems with it and there's still things I want to tweak but those small changes, those, those tiny little choices that you make can radically alter the fairness of the game, the outcomes that you expect to happen, uh, the perceived fairness by the players, and the actual enjoyment of the game by the players. So, what does that have to do with politics? God, everything! Like, I've been tweaking this game for months, and I'm a relatively smart person, if I say so myself. I am not dumb. I understand uh, I understand probability. Um, I understand psychology to some extent. But even still, with my time devoted to thinking through these issues, I still ran across problem after problem after problem, even though I had the best of intentions and a lot of free time to design this stuff. Um, I couldn't foresee all of the circumstances because I could not foresee how the meta, how the changes in the meta would affect how the players would react to the game. I try, and, and after playing through enough times examining that meta, I definitely can definitely see how certain things would go now, but if I were a politician, and if I were crafting, let's say, hmm, healthcare law, I would fuck it up real bad the first time around. Because I have no understanding of how the players are going to react, how the taxpayers are going to react. Um, I have no understanding of how the tiniest tweaks I make will totally shift the way that people interact with certain systems, uh, with certain laws. Um, and there are things that can help do that. There are think tanks, there's the Congressional Budget Office, there are plenty of people doing analysis. But at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, it's super difficult to create something perfect the first time out. And only through tweaking those rules and then seeing what happens, are you ever going to be able to understand the meta well enough to create a better version next time? If each time you just throw out all the rules and then you introduce new ones, you're going to have the same constant problems with um, not understanding the meta of your game. You will never understand why the players behave to your rule set in a certain way unless you examine those specific changes that cause players to react. So, my modest proposal is that every lawmaker, every senator, every congressional representative, every executive, everyone that makes decisions about other people's lives Take a couple courses in game design. Try to make a game. Try to make a fair game. Um, you know, create even the, the most basic rules. Try to design something like checkers. Uh, you'll see that the smallest tweaks will favor one side or the other. And especially if you're trying to make the game asymmetrical. Which, spoilers, most politics are these days. So... I'm not saying one way or another what people should do, but think about the meta. Think about how these tweaks, these revisions will affect the people who have to live with these changes. And think about how loud and angry people get about tiny, tiny changes in Overwatch and in League of Legends, and then try to understand how that applies to the realm of legislation. All right, hopefully that wasn't too heavy, but um, that was something I've been thinking about. So uh, next time I'll try to talk about something lighter. I, it'll probably be around Valentine's Day, so maybe I'll talk about love and romance in games. I don't know. 
You can't be the boss of me. Whatever. Alright, bye.